Hi everyone, thank you so much for being patient. We had a couple of technical difficulties, but we are almost there. And Deborah, I see you in the audience. Um, to, go, to get on stage, you just clicked in the bottom left-hand corner. There's like a little circle icon with two um, equal signs and you just click on that. And at the very top, it'll say, um, turn on video. And if you click that, then we'll all be able to see you. Let's try that out and then we'll jump get started. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. That's a awesome. Today. <laughs> <laughs> we figured it out. You know, we live in an age where there's lots of tech issues, but it's all good. <laughs> good. All right. Well, I guess we better get started. So hello, Firesiders. Welcome to Adventures by the Book, where our mission is to connect people and communities through the superpower of books. I'm your host, Amber Reinhardt, and I am delighted to be hosting our first Fireside Chat of 2023 with actress and award-winning author, Deborah Goodrich Royce, which we're so excited to talk about her new book today, Reef Road, which I have a copy of right here. And the cover is just so beautiful um, and the book is really good. So I recommend it to anybody. Um, we're going to have Debbie in the audience. She's going to post um, in the little fortune cookie in the middle of the screen um, a link. So that way you can purchase the book if you want to. So that's coming up soon. So keep your eyes ready for that. And today's approximate 45 minute chat is intended as a conversation. So for those of you in the virtual audience on Fireside who want to jump in and talk to Deborah or I, um, you're going to want to go on to the bottom uh, left hand corner of your screen and click jump on stage and we can invite you on here and you can speak with us directly. So we really want it to be a conversation um, and we hope that you'll join us later on. And then did you know that if you are in the audience, you can broadcast this conversation live by again going to that little circle icon in the bottom left hand corner of your screen and clicking broadcast to the world. Um, hopefully Debbie will do that soon. If not, um, I'll do it a little bit later. But other than that, I think we should get started. So a little bit of background on Deborah. Deborah Goodrich Royce's literary thrillers examine puzzles of identity. Her books include Finding Mrs. Ford, Ruby Falls, and now Reef Road, which we're gonna be talking about today. Um, Deborah began her career as an actress, starring as Silver Kane, sister of the legendary Erica Kane on the ABC soap, All My Children. She, was, she went on to star in feature films such as April Fool's Day, Just One of the Guys, TV movies such as Return to Peyton Place, and The Deliberate Stranger, which I watched, and I really wanna talk to you about that later, um, and a series, and other series such as Beverly Hills, 90210, and 21 Jump Street. All exciting things. In her new novel, Reef Road, when a severed hand washes ashore in the wealthy enclave of Palm Beach, Florida, the lives of two women, a lonely writer obsessed with the unsolved murder of her mother's best friend, and a panicked wife whose husband has disappeared with their children, collide as the world shudders in the pandemic lockdown of 2020. So there's a lot going on here in this book, a lot to talk about, a lot to break down. We are so excited that you are here with us today. Deborah, everyone, if you can give a little round of applause. There's a little emoji that you can maybe do. Um, we're excited to get started. Thank you, Deborah. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> I'm excited to be talking to you as well. So before we get into Reef Road, I always like to ask our guests um, just a little bit before 
you were a successful writer. Can you talk about where you grew up, your first exposure to books, and if there was a writer or someone in your life that you looked up to? Yeah, so I grew up in suburban Detroit in, um, you know, a town called Warren, Michigan, and I was an only child. So, of course, like so many, I was a big reader. I grew up reading, and I was thinking about that the other day. And in terms of childhood books, I would think of something like the the Secret Garden, you know, oh. going a little gothic. And then as a teenager, it really was Jane Eyre and, and you know, uh, Wuthering Heights and The Woman in White and Rebecca, all of those books, uh, Anna Karenina. All, I, like probably a lot of girls, I read a lot of classics okay. first, which I think it was just coincidental. I don't think it was a plan, but it was worked out well. I love that. I read a couple of those books. Um, I think classics really do pave the way and shape, um, you know, our love for literature. And that's, I definitely remember that in high school, reading a lot of those. Um, can you share a bit about your trajectory through all of your fields of interest before you were a writer, specifically your career as an actress? I'm sure that had an impact on your writing. Um, it did. It did. So, uh, I graduated from college with a degree in French and Italian literature and history. Ha ha. What <laughs> you do that? So I had this weird idea that maybe I'd go to graduate school, you know, for foreign service. I didn't even know what that was. But I was cast in a movie as a background dancer. And that gave me kind of the false impression that it was a super easy business. So I went to New York after graduating college, really to pursue dance and ended up transitioning to acting. And I had a really nice 10 year run as an actress. I did a ton of commercials. And then my first big job was this big role on the soap opera, All My Children. And I did that for a couple of years. And when I left that, uh, Paramount Pictures flew me to Los Angeles to screen test, which sounds so fancy, but it was like you know, a coach ticket and they put me in the Hollywood Holiday Inn, but it all felt really glamorous at the time. So I, I did this project with the actor Christopher Lloyd, if you remember him, the guy with the white hair from Back to the Future. <laughs> yes. Great guy. So I did a pilot. It wasn't picked up, but I ended up moving to L.A. and I had a really nice 10 year run. And in that run of acting, I did do that movie with Mark Harmon about Ted Bundy, which we can talk about. So the next stage, I had two children, got married, had two children, and the bloom was a little bit off the rose with acting. And my first husband and I had an opportunity to move to France. And we did that. He had grown up there. And in Paris, we're now into the early 90s, I was hired as a reader for a French film studio. They wanted native English speaking readers because they were investing money into British and American films. So it was a really nice entry level job and f going a little more toward the editorial chair, which I inhabited for a while. Uh, you know, a reader, it's a cool job actually. You read a screenplay or a novel, you synopsize it for the studio heads, and then you give a page of comments. So my very wow. first job was A.S. Byatt's novel, Possession, which is one of the great novels. And so I'm living in Paris, I'm reading for a living, and I thought, this isn't bad. And we ended up moving back to the States, and that's when I was hired uh, at Miramax as the story editor. And a, a story editor at a film company is like a book editor. So I spent a lot of years in the 90s editing. And, you know, when you are in that desk editing other people's writing, it forces you to really think. And certainly I was working with some of the greatest writers in the movie business at the time. So that's what I did. And then I ended up leaving Miramax eventually because it was just a very demanding job and I had two children but got writing more on my own, uh, went through a divorce, remarriage, um, and in life, one of the crazy things my wonderful husband and I have done, we've done a lot of restoration projects, including a cinema called the Avon Theater in Stanford, Connecticut. And that was the genesis of a close friendship with the actor Gene Wilder, who became a, 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 
an encourager of my writing. And so there was just kind of this magic moment where I got serious about it. And I'm now on my third book. No, and it, it sounds though like it's always kind of been with you, that writing, you know, just like waiting to come through. Um, but yeah, that, that dream job in Paris sounds incredible. So that's exciting. Um, Let me be honest. I mean, I think I was paid $60 a screenplay. So it's, you know, it was, a, you couldn't really make a good living, but it was interesting and fabulous. That's, a, that's awesome. Um, I think now we should dive right into Reef Road. Okay. So if everyone can check in the middle of their screen where the little fortune cookie is, you can get your copy of Reef Road right now. Um, I think you're going to want to, especially after we talk about it. So without giving anything away, Deborah, can you just give us a little bit um, of the background of the book? Yes. So when March of 2020 rolled along and the pandemic shut us down wherever we were. I happened to be in Palm Beach, Florida, which is a very glamorous community on the surface. And you think about uh, that great line, uh, a sunny place for shady people. <laughs> I, I don't know who said that. I think it was Somerset Mom when he was talking about the French Riviera. But as I was there, I decided to finally spend some time investigating a true crime. My mother's best friend was murdered in 1948 in Pittsburgh when my mother and her friend were both 12 years old. It was um, an extremely violent crime. She was stabbed 36 times and found in the kitchen by her parents, or in the hallway, the dining room actually. And it had a huge effect on my mother and eventually me. Um, so there I was in this pandemic lockdown with a lot of time on my hands. And I found that there was a tremendous amount of material available on the internet. You know, all the um, newspaper articles of the era have been uploaded. So in doing the research, I decided I did not want to write it as nonfiction. First of all, I like to write fiction. I think in fiction, you can really get to the essence of the truth of what you're trying to say without the encumbrance of all the pesky little factual details. So what evolved out of that and this feeling of Palm Beach in this COVID lockdown and claustrophobia was a dual narrative of two women. There's a storyline of a writer who's researching the murder of her mother's best friend and she's kind of an obsessive character and she's researching all sorts of murder statistics. And then there's a, a more plot-driven thriller, uh, which is the story of a young woman named Linda Alonzo, whose very handsome husband and children disappear early in the lockdown. And security camera footage from Miami International Airport reveals them in their face masks, uh, getting on a plane bound for Buenos Aires. And because of the pandemic and the border closures, she, this young wife, is unable to follow and find her family. So you have these two women in Palm Beach, you have them boxed in by this pandemic, and you start to peel the onion of what one story has to do with the other. It truly is um, a page turner. You know, uh, I could not put it down and I haven't completely finished it, but I am halfway and I cannot wait to see how it ends. Um, so because you mentioned that it is a dual narrative and you do have the perspective of the wife and um, the writer's thoughts, right? Can you talk a bit about these two characters, their relationship to each other? Um, and I'm just curious, which one was easier to write for? That's a great question. So I wrote the writer's voice in first person. Her chapters are a lot like journal entries. They're always called a writer's thoughts. And I really allowed her to go off in, in digressions and flights of fancy, and it becomes a little meta. She does talk to the reader. Uh, so that's a very distinct tone. As I said, in the wife's chapters, um, it, that's, it, again, more plot driven. It, it's structured like a book within a book. Uh, they have their own titles and their own chapter numbers. And that's in third person close. I, I wanted to be at a little bit of a remove from Linda Alonso. Linda's chapters are very noir. And if you like the genre of film noir, you, you would know that 
you should pay close attention to the woman and what she's really up to in a story that's noir. So I think this would be true of Linda. I loved writing them both. I loved switching from head to head. Uh, I was able to indulge different things uh, with the writer. I was able to completely indulge my obsessive neurotic side. And with Linda, <laughs> I was able to indulge, I mean, she's a very sexy girl, so I was able to indulge that side a little more. Uh, you know, listen, they're, they're both unreliable narrators, but <laughs> I love them both. Yeah, in the best way, right? It keeps the story going. Um, so you identify the wife, Linda, early on, but you don't ident um, reveal the identity of the writer. So can you share a little bit about your reasoning for that? It's going to be one of the plot twists that comes along. <laughs> I like writing plot twists, and I like doling out the information bit by bit. I had a fantastic editor who told me once uh, uh, with my book, Ruby Falls, she said, I want you to re-watch the movie The Sixth Sense. Mm -hmm. And The Sixth Sense, if you've seen it, it's structured very well. You, you're going along following the story, and then there's a moment of an actual twist, not just a reveal, but a twist, when you realize what you thought was going on is not going on at all. And she said, when you get to that point, what they do in the film is they do a little flashback of the breadcrumb trail that has been laid for you. So you see, ah, yes, those are the moments when I should have seen that coming. <laughs> so in books, you don't necessarily give a flashback, but you better have that breadcrumb trail. So when you come to that moment of a big twist, even if the reader didn't see it coming, the reader should be able to think, yes, 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 I see it now. Yes, and I think you did that very well. Um, and it was it was so different than any other book I've read before because of those, you know, the writer, almost diary entry. It It really did do that well, so... Thank you for that. Um, and then as we talked about before, uh, the book depicts the COVID life, you know, in terms of isolation and loneliness. Um, and is it fair to say that this book would not have been possible without COVID? Um, and, and if so, you know, how did, did you know when you wrote the story you wanted COVID to be a part of it or was, did COVID help create the story? Really all of the above. <laughs> the book wouldn't be what it is without COVID. COVID helped shape the story, and I knew I wanted to write COVID as a background. I think the book, to be clear, is not about the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown, and it's not about whatever happened politically after that. It's not about all that stuff. It's a setting is what it is. It's like, in many ways, I think, like a wartime setting. We've read novels that are set in World War One, World War II, any war, you name it, and Settings like that, again, they box in the characters. They, they serve as constraints on the action that, that characters can take. They're obstacles. So when Linda Alonzo's husband and children disappear, it is the pandemic that keeps her from following them. That's a useful thing because then you've got a character who's sort of straining against something. So I... It worked very well for that. I also think it was very interesting because I was writing it day and date in the lockdown. And when I go back and read it, they're just little snippets that stri strike me because we don't really, of course we remember it, but we're not actively thinking about it. So there's a little moment where the writer turns on the television and um, there's that giant ship sailing into New York Harbor and it was called Comfort of all things and it was going to serve as a floating hospital. It didn't come to pass. It didn't go as far as it could have gone. But there was that moment in time where this could have gone in any direction. And I think it is, you know, we always look back at history with, with our current perspective, but I am intrigued by things that were written in the, era in which they're set because I don't know it just feels a little more alive yeah and this book definitely time stamps the pandemic it, it was refreshing to read um you know a character who is struggling through things that we also were struggling through so it was a great way to connect uh to her um so as you mentioned before this book is based off you know a real life murder that 
impacted your life. So if you are comfortable with sharing, um, was there any intergenerational trauma that impacted your, you know, your, your tra trajectory as a writer, as your career as an actress? Did, how long did you carry it with you before this story just had to come out? Yeah, that is really the most important question of all. That is the theme of the book. It really is about generational trauma and something, I don't know if there's a name for it, but a thing that I, I sort of call tangential trauma. Uh, you think about Michelle McNamara and she wrote the book, I'll Be Gone in the Dark. And she was very instrumental in solving the case of the Golden State Killer in California. And it, it killed her. She died in the middle of writing that book. But she was, uh, as a girl, there was uh, another girl who was murdered in her town. And it, it, it has an effect on you. And I also mentioned Dominic Dunn in the book. Um, his daughter, Dominique, was a young actress who was murdered by her boyfriend. And it completely changed Dominic Dunn's life. He then became this reporter of sensational murder trials when before he had been a film producer. So these acts of violence happen and they don't exist in a vacuum. And where do they go and how do they eke out? Let's talk about this real crime, December the 10th, 1948, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 12 year old girl is murdered. The brother is brought in for questioning four times. Yeah. Charges are never pressed. He was 19 at the time, so considerably older. I do happen to know that the brother was brought in again for questioning in 2008. I detail this in the book in a, you know, a fictionalized way, but that did happen. Um, so here I am, I'm the daughter of a girl who knew the girl who was murdered. This family doesn't know me. They don't know anything about me, but isn't it kind of extraordinary the things we carry and the effect of actions on people who would seem rather remote. And I think it is an important question to explore. I think scientists are exploring it. I read a really cool book recently called It Didn't Start With You about generational trauma. And they're really looking at it at a genetic level. Um, it's a thing. It, I love that expression. It's a thing. So yeah, I wanted to look at it. I don't know if I have any answers on it, uh, but I think it's important. So in, it didn't start with you. One of the things they talk about is we can even carry trauma that we don't know about. Wow. And they go into great detail case after case of, you know, let's say you have a problem holding on to money. You just can't hold on to money. You might work with one of these practitioners and realize you had a grandfather who embezzled money. So you're playing out some story that you don't know anything about. And they talk about metaphysical work you can do or psychological work where you sit and concentrate on this grandfather in the case we're talking about and say, love you, but this is yours. This isn't mine. I'm giving this back to you. So I've gone on a wild tangent, but it's a fascinating yes. subject. No, I don't think so. I think, you know, for me, at least the first step is writing down what you're feeling, what you're thinking and going back and looking through that. And then the next step is why, why, why am I writing this down? So I think with your book, you know, it, hopefully it helped you process what happened, but more than that, like, I hope other people in the audience or other people reading it will recognize a part of themselves in it and it can help in that way. So, you know, you just have to keep putting your work out there and being brave. So thank you for that. Um, so to switch subjects just a little bit, you refer to quite a bit of um, clever literary devices in your book. And I'm going to totally butcher this name, so please correct me. But one of them was um, Deus Ex Machina. Did I pronounce that right? Machina. Makina. Okay. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the implementation of these literary devices? Did you do it in, um, did you know going into the book that you wanted to include them or did you find them along the way? Well, I knew about the devices before. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know I was going to include them. And that was part of the fun of writing the voice of the writer. She's very sly. And she really does wink at the reader and she addresses the reader and she asks the reader questions. Can a writer do this? So deus ex machina, and probably most of you know, but it it's, comes from Greek drama, 
and it's a, de a device where the you know you the the gods were brought in like out of the sky to kind of fix a situation or change you know a situation and it's it can often be a very cheap device when you can't <laughs> get yourself out of a hole you you bring in you know an external and um the writer is teasing about it because she's talking about a very real thing that goes on in the story and it isn't really a deus ex machina situation at all but it could be perceived that way so that was fun Yes, it was very fun to read. Um, and even as an aspiring writer, it's nice to learn new things. Um, and then, so I want to talk a little bit about your book jacket. I know most authors don't have as much say in it, um, but it's just so beautiful. It's stunning. Um, I think it gives a little bit of the plot away. Can you talk about if you had any say in it or just your thoughts in general on it? I did have a lot of say in it. I oh, had great. a really... <laughs> fortunate experience where my publisher has listened to me on book covers and for I love all of my book covers that they're just gorgeous so there were two ideas we were playing with we were playing with the street sign of Reef Road it's a real street and I love the movie Sunset Boulevard and if you look at the movie Sunset Boulevard it begins with like a street sign and it's very grubby and grungy. The The problem, it looked a little, um, any version we did of it, it didn't look as professionally done. With this bird of paradise, so, and the spider in it. Yep. Just this idea of beauty contrasted with menace. And we spent a lot of time on the spider because you don't want like a real hairy, gross spider that looks <laughs> so horrible to touch that people won't pick up your book. So what we ended up with is really a silhouette of a spider. And the spider is obviously symbolic, and but it's it is does happen in the book there is i'm not going to tell you what happens but it is both symbolic and real well i love it so much and everyone in the audience can look at it for themselves in person if they go to the fortune cookie in their screen and get their copy right now um that'll be there for the rest of the chat um so before i continue with deborah i just want to remind the audience we've still got some time left with her so now would be a great time to jump up on stage ask any questions or comments um anything you want to know the floor is yours so while we wait for people to jump up i have a couple more questions on the writing process and true crime in general just because i am a huge crime junkie um so reading your book was fascinating and, you know, talking to you is fascinating. But I watched the Ted Bundy series you were in and you started with Mark Harmon, which was, you know, fantastic. So can you just talk a little bit about the experience of being, well, first I should tell people it was the Ted Bundy miniseries. And can you talk about the psychological, um, what you had to do to get into your character? Because your character was married to him. Um yeah, so what's hilarious, I was on CNN yesterday uh, talking about this book because there's a big interest in the true crime aspect of it. And they asked me to give them some clips from this uh, deliberate stranger. And it's three hours long. So I hadn't seen it in years. So I actually watched it this week. And then CNN did not use the clips I so carefully teed up. But it was fun to watch it so I can speak about it more intelligently. So I played a watered down version of the woman who actually married Bundy on the witness stand of his final trial in Florida for the murder of all these sorority girls. And he did a really crazy thing. Well, he was obviously crazy. He put her on the stand and in the middle of this gruesome trial, he just broke out and said, will you marry me? And she said, yes. He said, then I do hereby marry you. And that was legal and binding. So they didn't put that in the movie. They just show me there at the trial weeping. So how did I get into her head? Well, first of all, I read everything I could about Ted Bundy and, and this was the eighties. So there was a lot less available then before the internet. So there was the book by Anne Rule. Her book was called The Stranger Beside Me. There was the book on which the, the miniseries was based by the, the guy, the reporter, I can't think of his name, who was 
in this mini series. And I thought a lot about, well, why, why, why would she follow him across the country? She also, they believe, helped him break out of jail in, was that Colorado? Yes, or Utah, one of those states. And uh, she followed him to Florida. And I think she simply did not believe he did it. That was the only thing that made any sense to me, that she, it was just almost like a mother, like. My boy didn't do that. You know, that was just it. Didn't do it. Now, I've heard later they've divorced. You know, they had a daughter. Ted Bundy has a daughter. Yes, I know about that. And I think um, she was, she might have been interviewed, I think, maybe five years ago. I think I remember reading it, but I might be wrong on that, so don't quote me. But. I don't know about that. That would be fascinating. But yeah, so he was alive when we did it on death row. She was alive, and it was just the creepiest feeling. Wow. But that, I, I can't that even series that. holds up. I thought it was actually really good, very well structured. I was pleased to see it. Yes, um, it was fantastic. And I, I am obsessed with true crime. So I have watched all of the ones on Ted Bundy, even the ones on Netflix that came out. So, you know, just for you to even be there and, and be, have a front row seat into that crime is, you know, I can't even imagine it. Um, so as a former actress, when you write your books, do you write with the intention of them being translated to a script, possibly? Because I do think this would make a fantastic movie or even a series, um, you know, on a streaming platform. I do. I think very cinematically. I don't like writing screenplays. I don't think it's my strongest skill. You know, it's uh, the, the formatting is very particular and I don't in, in feel a natural ability to write in that format. I have written one screenplay with a writing partner, um, and he was better at that than I. Uh, but I do see it cinematically. I do structure my books into okay. what I would call three acts, and I also structure them with a little bit of a pop in the middle. So I feel like, you know, and this is fungible a little bit, but I feel like I, I have a bit of a something that pops at about, if you look at a thriller, it's generally about 300 pages. So there's going to be some big thing happening roughly at page 100 and roughly at page 200, but also roughly at page 150. There are going to be things that make you sit up and pay attention. Well, thank or, you so much. Um, I've been, I want to be taking notes on everything you're saying because it's such great advice. Um, so my next question just about the writing process is Stephen King has mentioned before that when we write, we write for an ideal reader. Um, and for him, that's his wife. So I'm just curious, is there anyone in your life when you're drafting your vomit drafts that you write for or are you writing for yourself? Are you writing for your characters? What's your thought process? I would have to say I'm writing for myself. Okay. Uh, and writing, you know, when I was really young, I dated people, you know, what, what would the public like? What would the people like? And it hit me. I thought, you know, there's no such thing. You're a person. If, if it's true to you, it will, by extension, be true for a certain number of other people, maybe not everybody, but you have to, I have to start and make sure it's true to me. That's the way I clarify it. Um, otherwise, it, it can be manipulative or artificial or, um, you know, uh, then you start gaming things. So what I would say is I've had the good fortune really getting my writing career going later that I'm more clear of what my voice is. I'm more clear of what I want to write. Yeah. And like Reef Road was a risk having these two completely different voices. And my husband is, is a strong reader of mine and I do show things to him but I said early on I don't know if anybody's even going to get this I mean this is kind of weird and um in a weird way <laughs> I've used that twice now in a row I need an editor it's getting the strongest response of all of the most positive response so it just goes to show you don't game it really write what you are called to write really create the book you want to create and after that, it doesn't matter. 
because you will get trashed by people and you will get praised by people. And as all that's going on, you have to come back to, is this the book I wanted to write? Did I say what I wanted to say in the way I wanted to say it? And then that's what, that's all you can do. That is so powerful. Thank you so much. I'm sure we have some aspiring writers in the audience that are taking notes and taking all of this to heart. So thank you for that. We do have about five minutes left. So I want to give the audience one more chance to jump up on stage if they want. Um, it looks like Debbie has a question for Deborah. So Debbie, you want to jump in? I do. Thank you. Hi, Deborah. Hi, Amber. I'm enjoying the conversation so much. Thank you for taking the time with us, Deborah. And congratulations on Reef Road. Looking forward to the official release date coming this week. So question for you. Well, first of all, um, I just I was looking at your website and, and you had commented, you said your thrillers examine puzzles of identity. And I loved that so much. It really made me think. So I'm not even sure what my question is related to that, but um, puzzles of identity. So people figuring out who they are, people figuring out what's going on in their lives. What, what does that mean to you? So to me, in the, in the thriller format, it really means figuring out the secrets that other people keep. You know, the, meeting people who aren't quite who they say they are. I think we all have secrets and our secrets are, generally speaking, quite benign. They wouldn't really make much of a difference <laughs> to anyone about anything. But I have in my real life occasionally met people who have really whoppers of a secret. Uh, I, I knew a guy who was a fraud and I, I knew him for years and all these other people knew him and it was just the darndest thing. And when it all came out that this guy was a total fraud, not at all from the country he said he was from, he had a fake accent. He had a fake British accent and he knew a lot of my British friends. It was just so wild. But he picked a particular region. He picked kind of this Liverpool accent. It was so fascinating. And I was living in LA and most of my British friends in LA were from London. So it, that was a clever bit. But the weird thing was with this guy, there was no smoking gun of like why he did all that. But it was so darn intriguing. Like, why on earth would a human being do that? And how did nobody know? And that's what I mean, puzzles of identity. It just fascinates me, stuff like that. Yeah, that is absolutely fascinating. Truth stranger than fiction, right? <laughs> and so I have one other question. It's not related to anything. Um, and this is really random, but it, um, it's something I've pondered before. And so I was reading some of your reviews and one um, reviewer just basically put all caps, short chapters, exclamation point. And she loved, she loved your book. I haven't had the benefit of reading your book yet, but so it kind of just made me think about, um, because for me, if I'm being honest, I'm more apt to read another chapter, read another chapter. If it's a short chapter, it just keeps going and going and going. It seems like it's it's more uh, biteable size pieces, if you will. But how do you gauge what a chapter should look like, where it starts, where it ends? I, I know that sounds like a simple question, but there's probably a lot to it in the pacing that, that goes into it. There is a lot to it. And my chapters are short, but they're not all the same length. It's not like every chapter is three pages or five pages or nine pages. You know, there are, I think, you know, three pages is on the super short side. But I have had an occasional three page chapter where it was, if that's all there is that I have to say with that thought piece. So a lot of writers will divide longer chapters into segments you know they might have a bigger break or they might have a cute little symbol or or ellipsis or um and and you know i certainly read <laughs> i feel like a, a five-year-old i read i read books with big words i read books with big chapters too but for me the organization of a short chapter it doesn't change the length of the book, but it, it's sort of an organizational device. And maybe it comes from being having been on a soap opera, you know, where they come to that cliffhanger at, at the end of something where they have that like da 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 and the characters are looking at each other. So I love the cliffhanger. And I I find that I, like you, really enjoy coming to that moment of like, oh, 
oh my gosh, I have to go to the next chapter. So there's, I don't know, there's a natural rhythm to it. Uh, and it, thoughts may continue from one chapter to the next. It's not like, you know, I'm limiting the thought, but there's something about pausing it, you know, coming to that sort of <gasps> breath. I, I heard a musician once say in music, what, and I'm not a musician, but they also write the pauses when they're writing sheet music. You know, there are the, the notes, but there are the pauses written in. And I think that's very important in literature as well. Totally agree with that. Thank you for that explanation and enjoying this so much. And um, our book club had met with you a while ago for Finding Mrs. Ford, and we absolutely loved you. So I hope other book clubs will take advantage of spending time with you that you're available. So thanks so much, and I'll get off stage now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie. Uh, we are winding down on time, so I just have a couple of closing questions. Um, one I have to ask, just because I have you here, you have your extensive history, you know, being an actress in true crime series and writing thrillers. I just have to know, why do you think we are so obsessed with true crime? Yeah, that's a good question. I've thought a lot about that. I think it's often women who are more obsessed. I think we're vulnerable. I think physically we are vulnerable in a world where men tend to be larger physical specimens. So I think as vulnerable people, it, it is, um, there's a natural inclination to look at these things that happen with, with a, there's a thought almost like, it's not quite magical thinking, but we feel like we can keep it at bay. We can understand like what, well, what did she do that maybe I shouldn't do? Or why, you know, I'm not talking about blaming the victim, but what what were the set of circumstances in her life? Because her life looks a lot like my life, but how can I keep that in her life and not let it into mine? So I do think there is that aspect of it. And then I also think, you know, there's something with biofeedback, like with, I took one little workshop in biofeedback, so I'm not an expert. But what I understood from it is you can't force yourself to calm down by saying, you know, just be calm and be calm and press the emotions down. My understanding of how it works is, so if you're in a heightened state of negative anxiety, in biofeedback, you're supposed to try to go to a heightened state of positive, uh, you know, energy. So instead of, you know, I, I'm afraid I'm going to die tomorrow, you go to, I might win the lottery tomorrow, and then you naturally relax. I think with looking at, at crime and thrillers and horror even, you're, you're taking all that anxiety and you're, you're putting it outside of you. Yeah, I, I specifically like the first point you made with just being a woman. And I, that might be true for me, actually, why I just take in as much content as I can. I cannot go for a hike without my whistle and my pepper spray, you know, cause I'm, I want to go outside. I want to hike, but I do have these stories, you know, the local folklore in my head. Um, and one of my favorite pot phone, by the way, and my phone. Yes. <laughs> Not thinking of weirdos. Uh, a dear friend of mine was hiking in the mountains and yeah. fell and broke her ankle and she was alone so you always need your phone yes that, that see that's scary it's terrifying um the my motto is from a podcast that i listen to and it's be weird be rude and stay alive you know do what you have to do to stay alive so um what's next on the horizon for you is there anything you can share with us a project a book anything yeah so i'm about 100 pages and in, in, into a new book and I have Ooh, copious hey. notes. I always take a lot of notes. Yeah, I got a funny phone call this year. Uh, not a phone call, I'm sorry, I got an email. I don't know why I'm thinking of phone calls. <laughs> um, I got an email from a guy who said, remember me? I was your best boy on survival game. Now, that's a very provocative sentence. Yeah. And a best boy is a term used in, in film, meaning the head electrician. Okay. So I knew what he meant by that, and Survival Game was a movie I did. 
And he went on to share points that we shared and I didn't remember any of them. And I got to thinking, isn't that a fascinating presence? If a woman is contacted by a guy and he has all these things that theoretically they did together and she just doesn't remember. And is it her memory? Is it him? Is he truthful? Is he lying? And so we're working out the layers of that. Oh, I love that. That's going to be such a psychological, you know, hopefully a thriller, but I love that. Um, and where can fans find you on social media? So I'm super active on Instagram. That's my most prominent uh, place. And one of the things I do, which is a lot of fun, I do a Friday Reads where I talk about other people's books. I have a video um, many Fridays, but I'm super active on Instagram and I have a really robust tour schedule with this book and all of that is on Instagram. And I have a website too, but Instagram is the main, main vehicle of communication that I use. And for everyone in the audience, if you do click that link in the middle of the fortune cookie, it takes you to our event page where we have all of Deborah's um, social media links where you can have access to her. Um, so feel free to do so. And then my last question, Deborah, is there anything else that you want to mention or talk about that we haven't talked about today? Oh, gosh, you've asked, asked such good questions. I think you really have touched on it all. I, I you, You're a really good interviewer. And I, oh, thank you. I feel good. <laughs> Satisfied and very pleased. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, you know, it's it was honestly a real treat to interview you, just because I am such uh, a true front, a true crime uh, obsessor. And this book is really, really well done, phenomenal, a great read for 2023. Um, I recommend everyone in the audience to go to that fortune cookie in the middle of their screen and buying this book right now. It comes out this week, um, so now or never, right? Um, thank you so much, Deborah, for your time today. Um, sorry we went over five minutes. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Right. Yeah. I don't yes. Where's the exit? Oh, um, leave the stage, I see. Okay. Yes, you can leave the stage. Bye. And for everyone else in the audience, I just want to thank you all for being here um, on Fireside with us. If you want to know any more about Adventures by the Book, you can click that in that fortune cookie, that link. It'll take you to our website um, and you can get notified whenever we have any more Fireside chats. But we also do Zoom events and in-person events. Our biggest one is in SoCal um, in February and it's called Superbook. And it's not Super Bowl, it's Super Book. And there's going to be 20 authors coming um, all the all around from the United States coming just to talk to you. So we really are, we'll be so excited to have you guys there. Um, and other than that, until next time, ask yourself this question, what is your next adventure by the book? All right, I'll see everyone next time.